Okay, before the video starts, let me explain the title and the thumbnail very quickly here. This video is technically two in one. The first half being me, you know, scaling and talking about Anubis and why I think he's really severely underrated. However, the second half of this video is technically a what if, or more or less explaining hypotheticals. What I mean by that is this video is kind of a sister video to my Okiasu video I did a very long time ago, where I kind of got into explaining, you know, what if Okiasu actually was smarter and, you know, what that could eventually lead to with his stand and a stand potential. Unlike me trying to decipher what Araki was saying in a couple interviews, this one actually has entire games about it. To answer the question, what if Anubis reached its full potential or went farther with its potential? What could he have done in Stardust Crusaders and even beyond that? Oh, and I almost totally forgot. Yeah, he does beat Jotaro and Dio, by the way. Stay tuned for that. <laughs> So I do think some context is required with Anubis, so I do have to explain a little bit of his history because without it, a lot of the scaling later in the video is kind of like not really that crazy without it. Approximately 500 years before the events of Stardust Crusaders, Anubis's master would eventually create the original sword that Anubis would be bound to. And that's basically all we know. Yeah, a little bit anticlimactic on that one. So yeah, Anubis's original master died for some reason and the stand kept on living afterwards within the sword. And approximately about 500 years later, Dio would eventually find the sword and then recruit him into the Nine Glory Gods to fight the Stardust Crusaders. And the only reason why Anubis joined was that Anubis was terrified of Dio and the stand, the world, as he thought the world and Dio were way too strong for him to beat. And that's what Stardust Crusaders says about Anubis. However, in the grander Jojo landscape within its lore, Anubis might actually be pretty special. Anubis was born a long time ago, and connecting the dots with the meteor that crashed in Greenland and the arrows eventually landing in Egypt, there is an extremely high likelihood that Anubis is actually an OG stand, like really OG. And I will admit it is a bit of rampant speculation, but it is still pretty interesting to think about how old Anubis is and how far he can actually connect back into the universe itself. And just for those couple of reasons and how it just connects back into the lore, I love Anubis tremendously. Metas is a lore fiend. I love, I love me some lore. I love any time there's Jojo lore to discover and pick apart. It just, I love it. And I love how Anubis just is a part of that. Well, aside from the history and the speculation, let's get into how strong this guy actually is. Anubis scaling isn't really that complex and actually just requires some simple chain scaling off of Polnareff and Jotaro for the most part. He seems to be at least a subpar Silver Chariot level type character, with the only notable feat at least at this moment in time being able to cut a pillar which can be calced at being like small building level at most to at least being like wall level, so he's really not that, you know, interesting at least here in this moment. At least by by the end of the fight, you can say he's at least relative to Polnareff and Silver Chariot. However, by the second fight, when Anubis takes over Khan, it is definitely for sure that Anubis and Khan become a Silver Chariot plus level character, as Polnareff and Silver Chariot can't keep up with Anubis or Khan. For the most part, he's actually just thrashing Polnareff around big time, to the point where Polnareff exhausts all of his abilities and needs Jotaro to come in. Off of that alone, you can definitely say that Anubis is at Polnareff level. However, it gets even better for him. Even Jotaro is sweating bullets. I'll even quote it for you. I barely got that shot in. This isn't good. He's really strong. We haven't seen one like this in a while. A stand that doesn't rely on any gimmicks. Just pure power. If you have Jotaro saying this, a guy who specifically specializes in using pure power alone and precision to beat his enemies, you might be a huge threat. However, at this stage of the fight, thanks to Star Platinum and Jotaro's precision, they are able to beat Khan. However, Anubis realizes this and now is able to adapt against it. And then Polnareff foolishly picks up the sword on accident and then becomes Black Polnareff. And now we enter the third round. The fight between Black Polnareff and Jotaro is pretty crazy actually. Jotaro for the most part before the fight actually starts is genuinely terrified at this version of Polnareff. He even states during the fight that he has to go all out against this version of Polnareff and Anubis. And if he doesn't, he will die. And honestly, he gets pretty damn close to killing Jotaro. After using Silver Cherry in combination with Anubis, Jotaro's basically against the wall. And luckily, probably just due to a fluke, honestly, he survives, but he has to use all of his strength to beat him. And technically speaking, this fight was supposed to continue on. Even though Jotaro destroyed most of the sword, a part of it did 
survive. And even if a little part of that sword survives, Anubis also survives. And there was supposed to be a shot that was supposed to be taken by Anubis, but if it wasn't for Iggy and coincidences, Anubis might have killed Jotaro. He is the closest minor antagonist in all of part three to kill him, other than Dio himself. To put it into perspective, if that shot would have landed its mark, it could have had devastating consequences for the rest of the Jojo universe. If Jotaro did end up dead at the end of this fight, the consequences could have been severe. Now, when it comes to overall stats, I would say at the highest you could place Anubis in combination with Silver Chariot is a star platinum level character. The lower end, you could possibly say that Anubis by himself is a Silver Chariot level character, maybe even Silver Chariot plus. Now, there is a bit of a gray area where you can determine how far his AP actually is or his durability as they are pretty lackluster on screen. But I would definitely say for a fact in terms of speed, he is definitely FTL plus to massively faster than light plus. And the reason why I place him so high up there is just because of his hacks and his abilities. The fact that he can learn from your opponent and get stronger and faster in real time and then use the self skill of his host to even get stronger is ridiculously overpowered. Not to also mention he also has crazy mind controlling hacks when somebody actually wields him on top of having the ability to cut through anything. Overall, Anubis is no joke and should not be underrated. This guy is hyper deadly. And that's not even factoring in how he can actually use use a host's stand and himself at the same time, potentially making him even stronger. However, we can keep on speculating. If he can control a stand like Silver Chariot, why not others? What other combinations of other stand users plus Anubis would lead to a hyper lethal threat, even more so? Just off the top of my head, imagine Anubis plus Okiasu. You remove the idiot factor from Okiasu and place Anubis and the hand just became an extremely powerful threat on top of being a master swordsman. So uh, that one's that one's a bit wild. No limit fallacies go crazy. Another one could be Josuke. Josuke can of course manipulate the environment around him, making him like highly defensive. And with that, you can actually start mixing up your opponents if you combine that with Anubis as he's able to slice through walls. Another pretty crazy one would be like somebody like Jolene. Jolene of course can unravel her body like string. So you can get this really cool combo effect of adapting and learning without actually getting hurt. In my opinion, I only see Anubis as a net positive for any stand user or any regular person. You become wickedly powerful on top of using another stand ability in combination with it. So it's crazy wicked. My favorite combination probably has to be Funny Valentine and D4C with Anubis. Funny Valentine basically has an infinite amount of lives. Pair that with Anubis who wants to always grow and adapt and you basically get like this infinite potential crazy stand combo. Insert Iron Man from Marvel vs. Capcom 2 here. Yo, you wanna learn how to do a fucking infinite? It does honestly suck how I probably can't actually fully go into like what his full potential is because it is honestly truly fascinating. If he can fight Star Platinum and Jotaro, what are his true limits? Who's knocking at the door? Oh fuck! Thankfully, a official non-canon material on this idea is true for Anubis. Entering Heritage of the Future, a very old fighting game that I do love a lot, does provide a answer for Anubis and his compatriots. And shockingly enough, it does get pretty crazy. <clears throat> I think I busted my voice screaming. <laughs> oh, fuck. Now, a little bit of context before I get into any of this. These aren't random fights. These are pre-made storylines with a set people that Anubis slash Chaka or Khan or Black Polnareff have to fight every time. So we can assume that these are Capcom's versions of these what ifs or potentials. And when it comes to Anubis and Chaka, it gets actually pretty insane. Chaka fights every single Stardust Crusader one on one and wins, by the way. How does he end up winning? We don't exactly know the details, but using an educated guess off of the original timeline, we can genuinely say it's probably due to a combination of adapting to moves, adapting to a other stand user's abilities, power and speed, and the whole cutting through any object thing. So people like Kakyoin, Avdol, and Iggy, and their stand abilities are probably going to be pretty useless against Anubis. It's actually even stated that Anubis's skill is far greater than even Joseph. And remember, Joseph is the guy who fought the Pillarman back in the day. So yeah, his level of adaptation is pretty nuts then in retrospective. And in all honesty, this isn't too far-fetched. 
far-fetched. Let's be serious here. In the original timeline, Anubis was able to take on two of the strongest crusaders and almost win. If he were to fight all of them individually one-on-one, -on -one, yeah, let's be honest here, he could probably end up killing all of them. If you have a stand that makes even Jotaro sweat bullets, you all should be shaking in your boots. Now, after fighting these Stardust Crusaders, Chaka and Anubis want to challenge Dio, but they first have to fight Vanilla Ice. And I do want to put some context here because it is pretty crucial. Vanilla Ice is the guy that took on three of the Stardust Crusaders and killed two of them and heavily injuring the last one. Arguably speaking, the two he did kill were the strongest. And then Chaka and Anubis take him on one on one and finish him off with the sun. Yet again, we do not know the true details of what happens during this fight, but he does end up winning. And honestly, it isn't far-fetched. By this point within this alternate timeline, he should be a star platinum level character with a crazy amount of experience underneath his belt after fighting all the Stardust Crusaders. So somebody like Vanilla Ice should be very easy to take out. I actually highly suspect that Anubis is actually abusing the fact that Vanilla Ice does not know anything about his body and the fact that he's just arrogant as shit, just showing how experienced Anubis actually is when it comes to fighting. He's basically just exploiting the weaknesses of the other fighter. Now we finally reach Dio the ending fight, and this is where it gets kind of confusing. How can in Anubis, a character without time stop, beat Dio. Now, I might be a little bit crazy here, but I also don't think this is far-fetched either. By this fight in this alternate timeline, Anubis has a massive amount of experience and a massive history of adaptation that has led to him to being a Star Platinum level character that, in terms of stats, they honestly should be pretty even, at least in my opinion. And with all this history of gaining knowledge and knowing how to fight and stuff, Anubis realistically is actually just probably going to exploit Dio's cockiness. Dio, and the reason why he loses so many times is because he's always trying to test his abilities. He is a arrogant fighter. If Anubis just exploits that, well, yeah, of course Anubis is going to beat Dio. It makes sense. Anubis went from fearing Dio to eventually gaining so much confidence and so much experience and so much stat increases that, yeah, of course he's going to be confident enough to beat a character like Dio at the end of the day. He went from fearing him to wanting to fight him. It just makes sense. An alternate way of how he eventually beat beats Dio could be like, I don't know, this might be the far-fetched one here, that he just adapts around time stop, which is maybe too unlikely to say, but it might be a possibility. But I'm still in the camp of him exploiting the weaknesses of Dio. I think that one's much more likely. By the end of this timeline with Inheritance of the Future, I can definitely say for a for sure fact that Anubis and Chaka become a Jojo antagonist level threat. If he's able to beat Dio, you should be shaking in your boots if you see this guy. Now, Black Polner's timeline is basically almost one for one. The only difference being he eventually fights Alessi instead of Polnareff, and he has a completely different ending compared to Chaka and Anubis, where he eventually he breaks the fourth wall and attacks the player for some reason, where in Chaka's ending, he just becomes a wandering swordsman. Looking at these two timelines, I still do think Black Polnareff even here is still stunningly stronger because, well, not only only is Anubis using Polner's experience, but he also has a, another stand to work with and a pretty formidable one at that. So just like the original timeline, Black Polner is still the strongest variation in any timeline. Now, I won't speak about Khan because he's boring in these games. He really doesn't do anything, but so I won't really talk about him. So overall, looking at the canon and non-canon material, Anubis becomes a monster threat. Like he's just genuinely in between Silver Chariot level to main antagonist levels of crazy. Honestly, man, I love Anubis. I love him. I love his stand, his extended lore, all the possible crazy combinations he could have with other stand users. He's overall just a fascinating character to talk about. And I hate how nobody talks about him. He's such a cool stand, man. Drop a comment or something saying that you like Anubis. He's just so cool to me. I love him. Super underrated stand. Well, with that being said, like, comment, share, subscribe, follow me on Twitter, stay hydrated. See you in the next one, ladies and gentlemen. Deuces.